Well, hello, everyone. I'm looking around to see the students from my class. There are a few of you here. That's wonderful. So if you notice any of the students here, um, congratulate them, because they also get a little extra credit and the benefit of the doubt when it comes to grades. <laughs> now, I don't know why the rest of you are here, because you probably aren't getting extra credit. But you're going to have a wonderful evening. I've known John Hott for a number of years. As a matter of fact, he was an external reader for my dissertation uh, when I graduated in 07. So I've known Jack, and he's helped my professional career. Actually, Scott might not even know this. Somewhere in the depths of the dean's office, there is a letter of recommendation with Jack's signature on it. So um, because of him, I am here. Another reason we're all here tonight is because the school was interested in helping seminarians and lay men and women training for ministry to incorporate science into their theology. We received, we applied for and received a Templeton Award for Science in Seminaries. As a matter of fact, we've received it twice. So Scott and I are teaching a course for a second time on how to integrate science into seminary education. Both times we decided we would use cosmology and Darwinian theology and have the students incorporate that. Uh, what difference does it make that evolution is the reality of how God creates? What difference does it make that we are descendant from the very first creature God ever called forth? And the seminarians are dealing with those issues now in class. And hopefully they will be for um, the rest of their professional careers as well. So it's because of um, our interest in science and religion that Scott and I taught this class and invited Jack to be here with us. Many of you were with us last, well, two years ago when we had Brother Guy Cosomagno here. Yeah, he gave a talk that was about space more than anything else, about space and how that brings us to the grandeur of God. Jack is going to bring that down to the planet for us because Jack works more with the cosmology and the evolution, kind of like I do. So it brings it right home to us, right home to us. And even beyond that, what does this mean for our spirituality? So you're in for a good ride tonight. Just to give you one more lecture that you're going to want to know about, it's the um, Thomas O'Meara lecture for um, January. Uh, you probably saw one of the slides up here. He's going to be talking about extraterrestrials and divine revelation. So we're going to go back out into space with Thomas O'Meara. A little more about John Hott. John had most of his um, career at Georgetown University, where he taught undergrads, and wrote 23 books, 22 books. And another one I just, was just told is coming out very shortly. It's a compilation of John's works. So if you want the condensed version of John's thought, you'll be looking for a book coming out soon by Wiffenstock. With all of the different books that John has written, the one, the two, I have to say, that caught me the most, Nature as Promise, the idea that nature is here to walk with us, to accompany us on our journey, the most intimate book about our relationship with nature that I've ever read, profoundly scientific and philosophical, but also very intimate. The other one, God after Darwin. What does that do to the church? How did it rock the way we thought? It certainly rocked the way I thought about the world and God and myself. Outstanding work that will shake you when you read it too. One other thing to say about Jack is that he is one of the few people, I'm the only person I know, one of the few who has received the Friend of Darwin Award. He received this award for working uh, in a trial, I'm looking for the name of the trial here, Fitzmiller et al. versus Dover Board of Education when they were trying to push to teach intelligent design in the school and the teachers themselves were saying it wasn't good science and it wasn't good theology but they get jack among other people to defend the science and the faith together and for this um, 
well, intelligent design was not part of the uh, required curriculum for that school or any other. And he receives a very distinguished Friends of Darwin Award. So all of that, I could go on and on. Uh, Jack's CV is this thick uh, with all of the good things, but you're gonna wanna read his work and you're really gonna wanna enjoy this evening. So with all of that, I give you Jack Hot. Well, thank you, Linda, for that very generous introduction. Uh, some of you were perhaps at St. Mary's where I gave a talk uh, last night. Uh, most of you were not, so I have to begin with my definition of a theologian. I was just introduced as one of those. What are theologians? Uh, theologians are people who don't make much money, but at least they know why. <laughs> and, and, and I always like to add that for many years, uh, very truly, I, I tried uh, very hard to, be, to become a philosopher, uh, but uh, cheerfulness kept interrupting, and uh, so I became a theologian. Now, last night I talked about evolution. Uh, I won't be talking too much about that tonight, and I assume that's okay because my experiences in settings like this, I don't have to spend a lot of time laying out the evidence for evolution, which you, you'd have to do in other settings. But just in case any of you are harboring uh, suspicion about the evidence for evolution, you might uh, take to heart what a famous Jesuit said one time when asked by his students, Father, what is the evidence for evolution? And he replied, why, the very fact that monkeys have hands is enough to give us pause. <laughs> so so if, if I begin with that, my lecture can only get better from here, from here on forth. A little over two centuries ago, the great philosopher Immanuel Kant instructed thoughtful people to ask three big questions. What can I know? What must I do? And what may I hope for? But I think if Kant were here today, given developments that have taken place in geology, biology, and cosmology, he would have to ask a fourth question, and that's what's going on? What's going on in the universe? He could not ask that question because for him, the universe was a vague kind of backdrop for the human drama or for the soul's search for authenticity and moral integrity. But since Kant wrote, developments in science have shown that this universe, which used to be a stage or a background, has become part of a drama itself. The universe we now realize from science is still coming into being. It's still a borning. It's unfinished. So it raises a question that Kant did not talk about, and that is anything significant working itself out in this universe, which is still on the move. He's also famous for asking or for saying or exclaiming that two things filled him with wonder, the starry sky above and the moral law within. But he did not see the kind of connection that we see today between the two. Certainly astrology throughout the ages has seen a connection between the skies and the human spirit. But now, science itself has drawn a very, very tight connection between the two. Let's start with the fact that all of us have minds and these minds are capable of thought and also moral aspiration and religious longing. But science today tells us we wouldn't have these minds at all were it not for the development of a very complex brain which can make the leap into thought. Without that complexity, there would be no thought. Without that physical complexity, there would be no such thing as thought. But to have these brains, we needed a process of evolution which over the last two or three million years has complexified the brain and nervous system of our primate ancestors and hominid ancestors to the point where we are capable of reflective thought and moral aspiration. But of course, we couldn't have evolution without life. And we would not have life without planets with just the right chemical composition that can give rise to life. And that includes especially 
the atom carbon, which has a special talent for bonding with other atoms to produce complex organic molecules essential for life. But now we realize, especially over the last 50, 60 years, that we can't take carbon for granted. It was not there in the early universe. In order to have carbon, and hence life and everything that's followed from that, we needed to have massive stars which take the primordial elements, hydrogen and helium, and heat them up because of the force of gravity to the point where they can, this hydrogen and helium can be transformed into carbon and then later into iron, and then when some of these stars explode, a supernovae, right before that, other elements of the periodic table, essential for life, are also brought into being. But we can't take these massive stars, nor the hydrogen and helium for granted either. We have to go all the way back to the very first microsecond of this 13.8 billion Big Bang universe that scientists are quite sure we have and we live in. And notice that at this first second, first instant of cosmic existence, the expansion rate was set, as was the gravitational coupling constant, to such a degree of precision that if they had varied infinitesimally, even a billionth or so perhaps from, what, from the values that they have, none of this succeeding series of events could have taken place and we would not be here. And there are other things that had to be just right. The ratio of electron to proton mass, the last time I looked it was something like 1 over 1856. If it were 1 over 1857, we would not be here. Life would not have taken place. Mind and thought would not exist. And other factors such as the weak, the ratio of the weak to strong nuclear force, the amplitude of ripples in the early universe. Martin Rees, the Royal British Astronomer, said six numbers, and none of them implied or required the others, had to be there at the beginning in order to have a life-producing and a mind-producing universe. So somehow or other, there is a much tighter connection physically, we see now in a way that Kant did not, between our minds and the physical universe, the starry sky above. So that it seems that the conditions for mind were somehow front-loaded, as some physicists put it, into the universe. Now, I don't want to make a big theological point of this. A lot of people use this as a kind of framework for a uh, design argument, a kind of natural theological argument for the existence of God. I don't want to get into that uh, because I think we can draw uh, conclusions from this that are not necessarily immediately theological but are indirectly of great theological importance. What if things had been just slightly different at the start? What if the expansion rate had been a billionth or so different from what it is? What would have happened? We would have ended up with a lifeless and mindless universe. Or if the gravitational force had been just slightly different from what it is. The same consequence, a lifeless and mindless universe. So what we can say now, in a way that Immanuel Kant did not, is that thought, the things that mind engages in, thought as well as moral aspiration and faith as well, all the things that we associate with mental existence, is tied much more tightly into a specific set of physical conditions and constants than we ever knew about until quite recently, in the last 60, 70 years or so. Astrophysics has changed the whole face of our understanding of the universe. So mind, morality, and everything else we associate with mind and the universe are somehow a package deal in a way that our ancestors, our religious ancestors in particular, did not see. So the moral law within is tied, it seems, much more tightly to the starry sky above uh, than Kant himself realized. But that brings us back to the question of what is this all about? What is this package all about? What's really going on in this universe which is still coming into being? Which is another way of asking the ancient question, is there purpose in the universe? 
Now, what do I mean by purpose? Purpose means simply the orientation of a process toward the realization of something which is self-evidently valuable or good. For example, we think of our own lives as having purpose if they're dedicated to bringing about something that uh, people take to be undeniably valuable or worthwhile, justice, peace, the practice of, of uh, ecological uh, care and, and th anything uh, like that. If, if you find something like that in your life that gets you up in the morning, uh, then that gives purpose to your life. So my question is whether anything analogous to that is going on in the wider framework of our existence, that of the universe itself. Well, most intellectuals, as most of you probably know, think that's a really silly question, this question of cosmic purpose. I don't know of any major philosopher who thinks that's a good question. Almost all the philosophers that I've encountered in my academic life think that we're beyond asking such a ridiculous question. Uh, so, and, and, and a lot of people, including some many theologians throughout the 20th century, never dealt with this question. Theology disengaged itself from the question of what's going on in the universe. Uh, existentialist theology in particular concentrated on the question, what is the meaning of my life? And a lot of people today, a lot of my students would say, well, what difference does it make whether the universe has a purpose as long as my life has a purpose? Uh, whether religious or the purpose that I put into it myself. Well, you can't say that anymore. Even back 80 years ago, the American philosopher W.T. Stace said something which I think is true. If the whole scheme of things is pointless, then because of the intricate way in which we now realize that each one of us is tied in to the whole scheme of things, if the whole scheme of things is pointless, then that pointlessness seeps down into our individual existence as well. Still, not many intellectuals uh, or prominent people, certainly very, very few politically uh, engaged people, ask questions like, is the universe purposeful? But there was one in particular, Václav Havel, many of you must remember the uh, late president of the Czech Republic and the inaugurator of the so-called Velvet revolution, used to give speeches in which he would say things like this, the crisis of the much needed global, and by that he meant especially ecological <coughs> responsibility, is due to the fact that we have lost the sense that the universe has a purpose. How many political figures would say things like that today? Pope Francis would. Uh, Pope Francis, in his recent encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si, clearly drew a connection between the need for ecological responsibility uh, and the question of cosmic purpose. And if you read his encyclical, you'll see that he has a very clear sense of cosmic purpose. The universe is a journey toward infinite beauty. So if purpose means the realization of a value, then the universe, which is in the business of bringing about more intense versions of beauty, could be called a purposeful universe. This is what the universe is about. He says at the end, we will find ourselves face to face with the infinite beauty of God and be able to read with admiration and happiness the mystery of the universe, which with us, not separate from us, with us will share in unending plenitude. There is no separation then between cosmic destiny and human destiny. And he prays, teach us to contemplate you, God, in the beauty of the universe, for all things speak of you. Years ago, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, back in the 20s and 30s, was talking about the purpose of the universe. He was one of the lone figures in philosophy to do so. And he said in his book, Adventures of Ideas, that the purpose of the universe, the teleology, as philosophers call it, of the universe is its aim toward beauty. 
So when I read Laudato Si and saw the proximity of the Pope's aesthetic thinking to that of Whitehead, I was thrilled because I've seen that very, very seldom. He says in his prayer, pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Beauty is the great value that gives meaning and significance to the universe. So this is what you might call an aesthetic vision of reality. But what we have to ask now in our contemporary uh, intellectual context uh, and in our scientific world is whether an aesthetic vision of reality and cosmic purpose such as we find in Pope Francis is compatible with science? Is it something that's intellectually and not just religiously plausible? And he goes on to say in the encyclical, we are each connected to the cosmic journey. He prays, give us the grace to feel profoundly joined to everything, to everything that is, not just to God, but to everything. How often have we seen this in papal encyclicals or in any official church teachings? This is something really new and interesting. So our hope is not to abandon nature or the universe in the end, but to have an ever more intimate relationship with it. I don't know whether he's thinking of what the Catholic theologian Karl Rahner was saying when he, in his theology of death, said that what we should expect in death is not a departure from nature or the universe, but a more intimate relationship with it. He called it the pan-cosmic relationship. To be is to be related. To be more is to be more related. Uh, to be infinitely related is to be God. It's a relational worldview that uh, is implied in this encyclical. So the question is, and it's a, it's a very saddening question in a way, but we have to ask it, why don't we feel more profoundly joined to everything that is? Why don't we feel that the purpose of our lives is to somehow participate in the journey of the universe toward the intensification of beauty? Clearly, as the Pope recognizes, we've lost both the sense of purpose and the sense of connection. And he quotes his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, who said that the external deserts in the world are growing, which is a major ecological problem, because the internal deserts have become so vast. So somehow the emptiness of the outside world mirrors and kind of emptiness within. So it's a question for spirituality. How did we lose the sense that the universe has a purpose? How did we lose the sense of our organic connection to nature? Or to sum it up in a simple question, how did the universe come to die in our minds and in our hearts? Is science to blame? As someone who's been interested uh, throughout my academic life in the question of science and religion, I can't help asking that question. Is science somehow to blame? If so, how? And is it perhaps that religion, spirituality, and theology have something to do with this sense of the emptiness, with even the death of the universe? And those are questions I want to explore with you tonight. Let's start with science. Doesn't science rule out cosmic purpose? The famous Nobel Prize winning physicist uh, Steven Weinberg, who teaches uh, over here at, or has taught at the University of Texas in Austin throughout most of his life, is famous for saying that the more comprehensible, meaning the more scientifically comprehensible the universe has become, the more pointless it also seems. That has been quoted many times. Another thoughtful 20th century physicist, Richard Feynman, writes, the great accumulation of understanding as to how the physical world behaves only convinces one that this behavior has a kind of meaninglessness about it. 
and Margaret Geller, just to pull one name out of the hat of thousands who think similarly when asked to comment on Steven Weinberg's sentiments, so say, of course it's, it's pointless. What point? It's just a physical system. And uh, an acquaintance of mine, the physicist Lawrence Krauss, wrote recently in the New Yorker, echoing Weinberg, <clears throat> the more we learn about the workings of the universe, the more purposeless it seems. And that's pretty much, I think, the majority of opinion among uh, eminent scientists and among most uh, British and American philosophers. <clears throat> of course the universe is pointless. Uh, there is, of course, uh, always a minority opinion. In this case, there are people who say there is purpose in the universe, and as one uh, New York comedian has said, except for certain parts of New Jersey. <clears throat> so there's not universal agreement on this. But before science came along, it was much easier for people to think, especially since most people were religious, and especially in the Western context, that the universe was purposeful because the universe was thought of, a, of as a ladder of levels moving from matter through plants, animal, human consciousness, perhaps angelic spheres, and then ultimately superintended by God. Uh, the purpose of each level was to contribute itself to or to allow itself to be taken up into the next higher level and that into the next higher and then ultimately all embraced by ultimate reality and meaning to which we've given the name God. Uh, this scheme operates according to what you might call the hierarchical principle, which has nothing to do with ecclesiastical situations. It's a principle which maintains that a higher level can comprehend a lower in this hierarchy but a lower cannot comprehend a higher. And you don't have to think simply in terms of static vertical uh, structures, but in terms of concentric circles as well. The inner circles will be encompassed by larger ones and those by larger. The point is that understanding a lower level or a lesser level is not enough to give you competence to grasp a higher level. You need, according to all the great wisdom traditions, to undergo a process of personal transformation if you're going to become adequate to understand the higher levels. So they would say to the contemporary scientific world that knowledge of physics and chemistry, knowledge of the material level, does not prepare you to understand what life is. But of course today we have biologists telling us that ultimately life can be fully understood in terms of physics and chemistry. So we live in a quite different situation. The reason that we need to undergo personal transformation, according to the traditional Catholic, Christian, and Jewish and Islamic traditions, as well as many of the Eastern traditions, is that the more important something is, the more hidden it is, the more immaterial it is. Recall the process of transformation that Augustine, St. Augustine had to go through just to finally come to realize that something immaterial can be more real than material, a major uh, conversion process. So the more important, the more real something is, the more hidden, the more elusive it is. And that would mean, therefore, that if there is an ultimate purpose or an ultimate meaning to the universe, it would lie beyond human comprehension because, according to the hierarchical principle, human consciousness is lower, a lower level in the scheme of things. And a higher can grasp a lower, but a lower cannot comprehend a higher. So if there is purpose, humans cannot really comprehend it. <clears throat> and that's why it's such a difficult question to answer and to deal with. However, in the traditional uh, theological framework, you can have an awareness, or some people, if they've been transformed enough, can have an awareness of being grasped by ultimate reality and meaning. And that would be what faith signifies. The great theologian Paul Tillich defines faith as the state of allowing yourself to be grasped by that which is of ultimate importance.
And since we can't speak directly of purpose or meaning or anything really big, we have to use symbolic expression, analogical expression, metaphorical expression to try to represent something of what it is that we're talking about. But instead of apologizing for having to use symbolic language, uh, the traditional wisdom was that you should uh, not, not be, be proud of it, or you, you should rejoice in it, because symbolic language is required for talking about that which is of eminent importance. And uh, I just want to say before I go any further that uh, maybe I'm wrong about this in some cases, but I think probably most of us in this room tonight uh, have had our religious and ethical sensibilities sculpted in accordance with this pre-scientific uh, hierarchical way of looking at the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I, as I go on. And I think almost every legal system in the world still implicitly appeals to this hierarchical way of thinking to get its sense of the graded, the difference of values and the, 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 the culpability of people with respect to their ethical uh, behavior. <coughs> when our pre-scientific religious traditions became literate during the course of their history, some of them started comparing the universe to a book or a scroll. And just as a book can be read at many different levels of understanding, so also can the universe. Uh, to a, a monkey, uh, a book is black marks on a white page. The monkey's not wrong, but the book can mean more. Take a child who's just learned the letters of the alphabet. Uh, the book is a treasure trove of letters of a code. Again, the child is not wrong, but the book can mean more. Or take an adolescent who's learned to read and looks at the same book and sees in it the outlines of a great adventure story. Let, let this be a great classic novel, say. Uh, I remember when I was in high school, I think first year high school, I read Moby Dick, and that was pretty much the summary of my book report on it. It was a great, interesting sea adventure. But I read the book again uh, when I was on vacation with my family in uh, Nantucket, I took Moby Dick along with me and just, I was just astounded by the depth of wisdom uh, that was there. So uh, what's going on here? In, in order to see, in order to make your mind adequate to the content of the book, you have to go through a process of personal transformation. Uh, that would be essential to grasping or to coming into contact with what is going on. But interestingly, uh, as we all know, becoming a scientist today does not require <coughs> that you go through this personal process of transformation. You have to go through an intellectual transformation, but uh, uh, in, in terms of coming into contact with the real depth of reality, uh, the, the, the scientist uh, would say all you need to know is a uh, little mathematics and that will, that will give you the sum and substance of it all. And that's why you hear the term life is nothing but, mind is nothing but uh, this or that uh, in modern scientific thinking. <laughs> so the, the judgment on science that we would find from the masters and teachers, instructors of the great wisdom traditions is that modern science simply is not wired to detect cosmic purpose. Science decided <clears throat> at the beginning of the modern age that it was not going to talk about God, it was not going to talk about values, it was going to even abstract from the whole question of value and meaning. And even subjectivity is not part of the objective world that the scientists look at. So obviously science is not going to give you a sense of purpose. But does that mean, therefore, that there is no purpose? So to uh, answer my question, is science responsible for the expulsion of purpose from the universe? No, it's not science. It's the belief that science is the only reliable way to understand anything whatsoever. And that's a belief which, ironically, is incoherent because there's no scientific evidence for, to back up that belief. Scientism is the name of this belief. Scientism says take nothing on faith, but of course it takes faith 
to accept scientism. So there's a kind of uh, self-subversion going on there. But one book is not nearly enough to represent the universe that science has now given to us. This 13.8 billion year old cosmic story can best be represented, I think, or one way of represent it, re representing the temporal scale of this universe is to imagine that you have on your bookshelf 30 big books. And every time I give a talk on science and religion, I come back to this image, which I used uh, with undergraduates, and I think it, it worked very well with them. To imagine that you have these 30 volumes on your sh uh, bookshelf, and each of these books is 450 pages long, and each page stands for one million years in this story. As you know, the Big Bang takes place on page one of volume one, and the first two shelves are devoid of life and mind. Life, we now know, was not in a hurry to come into this universe. The Earth spins out around the sun around four and a half billion years ago, 4.6 billion. And about a billion or so years later, life finally squeaks out uh, of, of this story, uh, but not in a very enthusiastic way. It remains unicellular, single cellular, until you get almost to the end of volume 29, about 570 million years ago. We have the Cambrian explosion. All of a sudden, life begins to complexify in an accel at an accel accelerated pace. Uh, even so, dinosaurs don't come in until after the middle of volume 30, and they go extinct on page 385, and, uh, and uh, leaving only the last 65 pages of the book for the development of mammals and eventually primates and eventually ourselves. When does mind, which was Kant's interest, when does that come into the cosmos? What a different picture we have of the universe from that that Kant had. Mind, intelligence, our faith traditions, our moral aspirations, the moral law within, uh, the sense of purpose, all these come in only at the very bottom of page 450 of volume 30. So, so if you're a thoughtful person, and again, you can't help but wonder what is going on here. What is really going on in this story? Please don't expect me to answer that question. <laughs> but uh, it's a good question to ask, and how can you not ask it? Uh, is there, uh, to put it this way, is there some narrative thread that somehow ties what's going on on page one of volume one to what's going on on page 450 of volume 30 and any subsequent volumes that yet remain to be written. If the universe is still coming into being, why should we think that it doesn't have a future ahead of it? Perhaps uh, the volume, the 30 volumes will turn out in the final analysis to be only the dawn of a story, uh, the end of which we can only wonder about. But what I want to point out here is that for many scientific thinkers, for many sincere and thoughtful people, this new picture of the universe has only made the universe look more and more like a desert than ever before. Look at the vast tracts of lifeless and empty space and time in this universe in which there was nothing that resembles life and mind. It's that quantitative vastness of this desert period of the universe that impresses so many scientific thinkers. Uh, and it seems that in philosophical and scientific thought, what has happened is that the hierarchy, which gave people meaning for so many centuries, has been pancaked. It's been collapsed, flattened, so that matter which was the lowest level in the traditional hierarchy, is now the dominant feature in this picture of the universe. Matter, which comes from the, from the word mater, mother. Matter is the, really the mother of everything else. Mindless and lifeless matter is the source and origin and end of all things, according to the pessimistic view of many scientists and philosophers today. <clears throat> and life just ekes out as a kind of Luke, somewhere in volume 22, 
uh, in a spontaneous and apparently unintended way. And it takes many, many more billions of years before it turns into mind. And mind seems to be a kind of cosmic afterthought to a lot of scientific thinkers today. And meaning, which was the highest level in the traditional hierarchy, now seems in modern and postmodern thought to be nothing more than a kind of construct, a human fiction uh, or illusion that we create and project out onto the impersonal and cold universe to make it seem a lot warmer than it really is. But really, underneath it all, it's mindless and lifeless elemental stuff. <clears throat> so this way of thinking has caused the universe to die, at least in the minds of many, many influential thinkers. And it's something for us to ponder. <clears throat> What place then in, in this universe, in this culture that has been affected so much by science and cosmology, can we find for what we call faith or spirituality or for a plausible theology? How did the universe die? <laughs> there are many ways of telling this story. One very short and brief and I think intelligible way of doing so is that of the Jewish philosopher Hans Jonas, who tells us in his books on life, which are very profound, that before science came along, pre-scientific cultures were characterized by a philosophy you might call pan-vitalism, from the Greek word pan, which means all, and the Latin word vita, which means life. Pan-vitalism means that everything, it's the belief that everything is alive, not just animals and plants, but the skies, the stars, the rocks, the mountains, the rivers. Everything pulses with life in the panvitalist pre-scientific mentality. Even philosophers like Thales, the pre-Socratic philosopher, was a panvitalist. All things are full of these animating principles that we call gods. And even Aristotle, the most down-to-earth of the ancient philosophers. When he looked up above and saw the stars twinkling, just assumed that they're being animated by spiritual principles. So in a pan-vitalist worldview, which has prevailed throughout most of our human history on this planet, life is the norm and death is the unintelligible exception. Death is somehow an illusion. Death is somehow unreal. It's been thought of that way throughout most of human history. So imagine yourself as being part of a, a pre-modern, pre-scientific tribe and someone in your family or maybe even an animal has died and the inert corpse is lying there before you. What, what sort of thoughts would be going through your head? The panvitalist question is, how can anything be dead if everything is alive? And the answer was, it can't be. Uh, there's a life principle. There's a life world. There's a hidden world of spirit to which the life principle in this being, in this body, has departed and is still there and will still be around, will come around to haunt you in your dreams or perhaps console you but it's still there somehow. And I think we have to recognize that all of our great traditions, including Christianity, uh, took this spiritual world for granted as the framework for its belief in resurrection uh, and uh, immortality and in other cultures and reincarnation. So panvitalism has been extremely influential in shaping our religious consciousness. <laughs> But then, jumping ahead here, the age of reason and science came along. And in the modern world, panvitalism gradually gave way to materialism, at least in the thinking of, of very influential thinkers, especially in the modern world. Materialism is the belief that matter, lifeless and mindless matter, is the only thing that's really real and life and mind are not really real. They're epiphenomenal. They're interesting ways of arranging material stuff. This exile 
of mind of uh, the, or the birth of materialism was made possible by a kind of exiling of mind and life, vital principle from nature. And we associate that especially with the uh, innocent uh, thinking of Rene Descartes, which turned out to be not so innocent after all. What Descartes did uh, to try to clarify his understanding of the world is separate mind, which uh, Kant became very interested in. Kant was very influenced eventually by Descartes. He separated mind from matter. And by doing that, by separating mind from matter, thinking substance from extended substance or measurable substance, in effect he was saying that, if, well, if mind is over here and matter is over here, then matter is devoid of mind. Matter is mindless, lifeless. It's measurable, and that makes it uh, very interesting for science and technology. But matter has been divested of mind, of, of spirit. And E.A. Burt tells us that matter, now separated from mind, lifeless matter has become the philosophical foundation of most modern thought, the most influential forms of modern thought. Not all of it by any means, but uh, the most influential strains of modern thought have been uh, based upon the idea that matter is essentially lifeless and mindless. And life and mind, therefore, are reducible to states of matter. So the modern problem, unlike that of the panvitalist, for the panvitalist the problem is how do you explain death if everything is alive? The modern problem is how to explain life if everything is fundamentally dead. And that has introduced into our culture what Hans Jonas and the theologian Paul Tillich have both, I think independently of each other, referred to as an ontology of death. The word ontology refers to this question of what is really real, what has being. And in the modern mind, what has being, as what is most real, in other words, is deadness, not aliveness. And um, this is the, the ontology of death, and, and as Jonas puts it, that which is most intelligible, the intelligible par excellence, is death, not life. And that way of thinking has seeped into our culture. We can't help asking whether our culture of death that is still very much around us, and we heard about this morning, has been at least in some way uh, heir to this way of thinking. Thought is not always innocent. <laughs> so it, it raises all the more the question I asked earlier, what place for faith in this kind of understanding of the world? Just to make a transition to uh, my way of dealing with that question, I, I wanted to point out uh, something many of you are familiar with, and that's that the modern world has had a great deal of difficulty uh, coming to grips with uh, scientific materialism. And we find a couple of uh, good examples of this in British poetry. Many of you are familiar with Matthew Arnold's beautiful poem, Dover Beach. Uh, he and his beloved are looking out over the cliffs of Dover and seeing the waves coming in and out. And he suggests uh, to his beloved that this, uh, this gives him a thought, a thought about the sea of faith. The sea of faith, he says, <clears throat> and he's talking about his own life. He was deeply biased when he was younger, but gradually because of his entrance into the modern way of looking at the world, gradually lost his faith. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now <clears throat> I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Wonderful images of the deadness that seems to underlie the veneer of, of life. So what are you supposed to do if this is your worldview? <clears throat> the only thing you can do, he says, ah, love, let us be true to one another. We can find some warmth by huddling together in this dark and cold universe. <clears throat> For the world, which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor life, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. 
and we are here on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash by night. And he was not alone. Uh, the death of nature ac accompanied the loss of faith and hope and the sense of the death of God <clears throat> in th thinking of many others. For example, Thomas Hardy in this other lovely poem. It's ironic that some of the most Brit beautiful British poetry is about this situation uh, that refers, uh, that we can call the ontology of death. <clears throat> this is Darkling Thrush. Now notice the date. It was written in 1899, right at the turn of the century. I le leant upon a coppice gate when frost was specter gray and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled vine stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. We can find some warmth by huddling together. The land's sharp features seem to be the century's corpse. Notice the images of death here, outlent. His crypt, the cloudy canopy, the wind, his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth, the panvitalist way of looking at things, was shrunken hard and dry and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. Very honest self-expression. But then at once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead in a full-hearted evensong of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the glowing, the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around, but I could think there trembled through his happy good night air some blessed hope whereof he knew, and I was unaware. I like to recite this poem as a way of introducing someone who has been for me something like a darkling thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, a man who in blast beruffled plume has chosen to fling his soul upon the growing gloom of cosmic pessimism, a man who came along when, uh, not when frost, but when thought was specter gray, and sang out against the trend of thought in his generation and among his fellow intellectuals and fellow scientists. I'm talking here about the Jesuit paleontologist and geologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. I think this image fits very much the, the way in which he has been perceived by many of us as kind of like a darkling thrush, a lone voice at many times in the world of thought. And I find him especially helpful. Uh, he's been helpful th through my whole life because he has identified the problem that I've had to deal with as a believer and someone who has been deeply influenced by science as well. He wanted to tell us, to teach us, that faith need not be a flight from the universe. If we understand both faith and the universe, in the right way. The traditional spirituality in which he was educated taught him, and he felt this deeply and was attracted to it, that if you want to find happiness, you have to leave this world that has been described by many as a, a very dead type of universe, to leave it behind so as to find climactic communion with God up above, and he felt deeply this traditional spiritual attraction. But he was also a man of science. He became deeply immersed in geology and in other evolutionary sciences. Uh, after a spiritual crisis in which his spiritual director says, go for it, Don't, you're not gonna make a mistake by immersing yourself in science, and especially in his uh, beloved science, that of geology. 
And he learned from science, he felt it deeply in his bones in a way that most of his fellow religious people have not, that this world, the world of nature, is still coming into being. And that brought before him a whole new horizon of expectation and hope and anticipation that he had not felt in his religious existence. He felt very strongly in ways that so many of his fellow Jesuits did not feel and most of his fellow Catholics early in the 20th century did not feel. He was born in 1881, uh, died in uh, 1955. He began to feel deeply this world has a future. This world is still a borning. This world is still coming into being. And if that's the case, we can't help asking, where is it going? What's it all about? This world has a future. At the same time, he felt that naturalism, the view that this world is all there is, he felt that pure naturalism is a dead end because ultimately naturalism has to accept the scientific judgment that ultimately everything will, uh, even if it's trillions of years from now, uh, go down the slopes of entropy into the pit of nothingness. That's not something to cheer the heart either. So his lifelong problem, he called it the problem of the two faiths, whether to believe in a God up above or in the world's future. Uh, that was his problem. How do you resolve uh, this problem? And that's what I want to talk about, uh, because it's been a lifelong question for me as well. Can we find meaning, and therefore the possibility of foothold for faith, in this new cosmic story? And how would you go about doing so? It seems to me, and I don't have time to go uh, to defend why I've chosen uh, this particular typology, but it seems to me that there are three ways of reading this new cosmic story. And they're very distinct. These three ways exist in a hybrid form, I think, in a lot of us. But nonetheless, I think it's important to draw logical, crisp logical distinctions among these three approaches, uh, at least to begin with. The first I'm going to call archaeonomic. I'll define it in a moment. The second, analogical. And the third, the anticipatory way of reading the cosmic story. The archaeonomic view, as from a term that I devised from the Greek word arche, which means beginning, and namos, which means law, the archaeonomic view maintains that if you want to make the universe intelligible, you have to go back to the beginning and, s and find out what elements made it up, and what laws define the relationships between and among those elements. And if you can find that and clarify that, you have made the world intelligible enough. And the way in which you do that, since we can't literally go back into the past, is we take present complex things and we break them down. We analyze them. So this could also be called the analytical reading or the atomistic reading. We break complex things down into their subordinate parts, into more and more refined particulars. And what we end up with when we drill downward like that is pretty much the same as what was there at the beginning in the subatomic and atomic dispersal from which the whole Big Bang and its search for unity unfolded. And that's how you make the universe intelligible. We can associate a name. It's good to associate names with these uh, thoughts. Uh, Democritus, the ancient pre-Socratic uh, philosopher who said all you need to do to understand the world is to have two concepts, atoms, uncuttable particles, and the void of empty space. And everything that takes place is simply a reshuffling and reconfiguration of atoms in empty space. And there are still philosophers, in fact, eminent philosophers, uh, who are basically democratian, atomistic, analytical in their thinking. Uh, one of them, uh, Daniel Dennett, who is sometimes considered um, America's foremost philosopher, is still basically democratian in his understanding of life and mind. It's all nothing but atoms rearranged and reshuffled over the course of time. And that's a very appealing 
intellectually appealing way of trying to make sense of the story. And that goes quite counter to the traditional religious view that most of us inherited, the analogical worldview. And this is the view that says that you can make sense of things in nature, including in our new understanding of nature, if you look at them as analogies of a perfection that lies outside of, that's extra mundane, that lies outside of the world. So the intelligibility that we find in, in things is that they are symbols or faint replicas of a perfection which exists in the mind of God or in some platonic heaven. So we can associate the name of Plato with this general way of thinking. And it has deeply, deeply influenced Christianity, so much so that the 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche referred to Christianity as Platonism uh, for the people. Uh, and it's a very attractive, and it's a very lovely and very beautiful worldview. And it still appeals, and that's still the dominant way in which I think Catholic theology organizes itself uh, with some variations. And I wanted to compare those two views, the archaeonomic and analogical, with what, what I'm going to be calling the anticipatory way of reading the universe, which I think is what uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was trying to get us to switch over to, and which he never fully succeeded in doing. Uh, the anticipatory worldview says that we can't really make sense of anything in this story, anything in nature, without looking up ahead. Because if the universe is still coming into being, if it's still not fully realized, then it cannot be presently fully intelligible either. So to find intelligibility, we have to put on a disposition which most human thought has, has found repulsive, and that's to wait patiently for the intelligibility to emerge as reality itself unfolds. So the way to face reality then is by hope. Uh, and that's a quite different way of looking and making sense, looking at the world and making sense of it. We can associate this view with a name, the name of Abraham who was called forth by uh, the God of promise to, to take on faith that something big is going to happen up ahead. And I think uh, later on in the New Testament, we have the Gospels telling us that when Jesus first came into his public ministry, he didn't immediately draw up lists of do's and don'ts. He announced to people that something big is coming from up ahead. So the, the disposition of expectation, of bridled expectation, of anticipation, is another way of, tr of making sense of the world, but it's one that requires uh, great patience and the capacity for, uh, to wait, uh, because only those who wait will not be put to shame in the biblical way of looking at things. So we have three very, very distinct ways, uh, ancient ways, uh, which we can now apply to this modern question of how to make sense of the cosmos that science has recently given us. The archaeonomic view sees the story, and this is quite kind of ironic, it's through the analytical work of good scientists that we have been able to uncover the fact that the universe is a story. But I want to distinguish between analytical science and what I'm calling the archaeonomic reading. <coughs> There's nothing wrong with scientific analysis. Science has to analyze. That's the way it works, and we learn a lot that way. <coughs> but, the, <coughs> but the analytical reading or the analytical worldview goes beyond that and says that analysis is the only way to get to the intelligibility, to the meaning of what's going on. So it sees the story, but it sees no narrative or dramatic meaning 
It sees, doesn't see the universe as going anywhere. In fact, most of the people who accept the archaeonomic vision would say that the end of all things is going to be just like the beginning. The universe is going to devolve <coughs> and eventually decay into the primordial subatomic stuff uh, from which it came, only without the energy of that originating epoch in cosmic history. The analogical view <coughs> sees meaning, looks for meaning, but ignores the story that science is telling us as being almost completely inconsequential as far as the shaping of a spirituality or shaping of a sense of meaning is concerned. And uh, this is the attitude that I find in my own uh, church, the Catholic Church. For the most part, the Catholic Church uh, and Catholic thinkers, and this is certainly true of most seminaries, has not looked at this story at all. And, uh, or if it has, it sees it only as an intellectual curiosity, but having no religious meaning uh, to it at all. And so, so it reverts to the traditional, almost medieval, classical way of looking at nature as ha having no other meaning than pointing to a perfection that if we uh, look to carefully enough, we'll, uh, by contemplation, and by asceticism and by uh, living a good life and eventually by death can lift us out of the material realm altogether so that we can come into uh, the fulfillment we look for uh, with God. And the cosmos gets pretty much left behind uh, in this spirituality. Uh, there are many variations of this and I don't want to be too unnuanced in saying this because because it's I, I just want to point out that there's a kind of logical distinction uh, between and among these three approaches. Then there's finally the anticipatory approach, which says that um, the story, we, we do need to take the story seriously, is full of meaning, but we have to wait for it. We can't be too perfectionistic and too demanding. We can't demand complete clarity here and now, which is what the archaeonomic vision does. Both the archaeonomic and the analogical views, in a sense, in effect, abolish time. Time is insignificant. Time is something to be overcome or gotten away with, either by going back to the beginning before time began or leaving time for eternity altogether. So the first two views clearly do not have much love for the temporality that Einstein has discovered as inseparable from the natural world. Uh, so much so that if time stopped, nature would disappear altogether. Theology has yet to take time seriously. The anticipatory view, however, does take time seriously, uh, which means that we can't expect the fullness of time to hit us in the face right in this present moment, but that we can hope for the fullness of time. And as Paul Tillich would say, actually, we're stronger when we wait than when we possess. And I think that's the Abrahamic way of looking at things. The kind of meaning that the anticipatory view looks for is not mathematical, or architectural or engineering exquisiteness, although those are interesting in themselves, the kind of meaning that the anticipatory view looks for is what I call narrative coherence or dramatic coherence. So that if you, for example, attend a drama, you don't walk out after act one or act two. Uh, after the intermission, you go back in and see where the drama is going. So uh, I would say that what science has given us recently is a new metaphor for nature, uh, not that of design, but that of drama. So the question in science and religion today, uh, contrary to what the intelligent design anti-Darwinians say, is not whether design points to deity, but whether the cosmic drama is somehow carrying a meaning inside, and is there something going on inside? And that's what we should be looking for. And I'll, I'll give some ideas as to how to do that just in a moment. 
The first view, the archaeonomic, uh, gives us this philosophy of cosmic pessimism, and I think that dominates the philosophical world uh, today and much of the scientific world. Uh, the analogical view uh, oftentimes becomes a kind of otherworldly optimism, which is quite content to leave nature behind eventually. Uh, and the Abrahamic view, I don't know what to call it, call it cosmic patience. So uh, we're faced then with a question that Teilhard leaves us with in his problem of the two faiths. Uh, which reading uh, makes the most sense, uh, both spiritually and intellectually? Well, let's look at them uh, just a, a little more closely here, and I'll conclude with this. Uh, the analogical reading uh, seems to be uh, attractive, to especially to traditionally religious people. And I have to confess, I was raised in this way of thinking, and I still am deeply attracted to it. Part of me loves this vision. It's a beautiful vision in many ways. It's very fulfilling. And, and, and it's, uh, it's not uh, without faith of, of some sort, so I don't want to in any way disparage it. How, uh, what, what makes it appealing uh, to, to us is that it allows us to, to give a clear value to things in nature that can provide the basis for an ethical and even a legal system. Uh, so that if we represent matter following E.F. Schumacher, if we represent matter by the letter M, then we can look upon plants as having something that matter does not, a kind of vitality which we can represent with the letter X. And then when we move up to animals, animals are made of matter, and they have vitality, they have X, but they also have the factor of sentience and awareness. They have something that the lower levels in the hierarchy do not have. And then when we move up to humans, uh, the way the traditional analogical reading sees it is we have not only matter, not only vitality, not only sentience and awareness, but self-awareness. We're not only conscious, but we're conscious that we're conscious. So there's an ascending hierarchy of being and a hierarchy of value, which can anchor very clearly a kind of ethical uh, system that allows us to value different kinds of life in, in ways that others do not have. So what's the problem? What's the problem with this approach? I'll have to go through this rather quickly, and I just want to suggest these. I can't develop them, but just for your own reflection. First of all, the analogical uh, way of reading has no sense or no use for this great discovery of deep cosmic time that science has given us. Furthermore, it fails to acknowledge the gradualism that exists between and among these levels. If you place the hierarchy on its side and look at it as a long river flowing over many, many eons of time, there's a gradualism in the cosmos that the analogical view does not fully take into account. And furthermore, the analogical view, since its main concern is with eternity, that which is timeless, is not terribly interested in the cosmic future, which has now opened up to us through the instrumentation of astrophysics and evolution and geology and cosmology. Little interest in the cosmic future uh, among those who are spiritually rooted in the analogical tradition. And in some versions of the analogical tradition, the more otherworldly or dualistic versions, there's a tolerance for the idea of a final separation of souls from nature, quite different from what Pope Francis is suggesting, that we should feel connected to everything. And uh, uh, ironically, the analogical view, by allowing for a universe which after spirit and soul has escaped from it into the eternity, leaves the universe bereft of spirit. It leaves it dead. So we have to ask the question, to what extent has the analogical vision, or at least certain versions of it, contributed to our sense of the death uh, of the universe? It's just a question to think about. <clears throat> and also, <clears throat> as many people have pointed out, <clears throat> including many modern philosophers, <clears throat> The analogical view can foster a kind of unrealistic perfectionism and puritanism and patriarchy and uh, moral passivity at times. <clears throat> and isn't it a convenient platform for clericalism? 
a worldview that uh, clericalism almost has to cling to in order to maintain its plausibility. Clericalism, which you know, Pope Francis has identified as one of the major problems in contemporary Catholicism. <clears throat> and ecological liabilities, if, if it's the eternity that's our primary interest, uh, to what extent does that distract us from taking care of the world we live in uh, here and now, and also distract us from the possible future that this cosmos has out before us? And isn't the current crisis in Catholicism, doesn't it have something to do with the plausibility of this analogical, not just intellectual, but spiritual plausibility of the analogical worldview? I'll just leave that as a question, of course. <clears throat> well, uh, if that doesn't work, what about the archaeonomic reading? Uh, this is the default position <coughs> of, of many uh, people who have become disillusioned with the analogical view, does, is this uh, an acceptable alternative, uh, an acceptable way of reading the universe? It seems at first to be intellectually attractive. It's very intellectually appealing, primarily because it allows us to reduce X, Y, and Z, the elements of increasing value in the traditional hierarchical view. It allows us to reduce them all to M to measurable, mindless, and lifeless material stuff. It appeals to the mathematical inclinations of the modern scientific mind. <clears throat> but it turns out to be a measurable universe, but also a mindless universe as well. Uh, in the case of some devotees of this way of reading the universe, life, not only life, but culture, everything that's going on here and now, all the diversity and beauty that we that gets, gets us up in the morning, is, uh, from an intellectual point of view, ultimately nothing more than elemental, lifeless simplicity, as Peter Atkins puts it, masquerading as complexity, dressed up as complexity, but beneath the clothing of apparel of complexity is the real world of elemental, lifeless, and mindless simplicity. It's a very appealing, intellectually appealing vision. However, is it coherent? Obviously, it's a spiritually deadening view, but is it intellectually coherent? I think not. And here, I think one of the most brilliant contributions of Teilhard de Chardin, which very, very few people have, have uh, seen because very few people read Teilhard. But he has a, a, a brilliant exposition of the intellectual incoherence of the archaeonomic and analytical worldview. It goes something like this. To archaeonomy, the world becomes, in Teilhard's view, more and more incoherent the farther back we take our analysis of this universe. So take any present example of living complexity and subject it to scientific analysis. What that amounts to, in effect, is carrying our minds back to the cosmic past from which gradually the complexity has built up. But in a way, uh, that's incoherent. So take a living organism and break it down into its cellular, cellular components, break the cells down into large molecules and into smaller molecules, and break the molecules down into atoms, and then break the atoms, as we're doing now in our particle accelerators, break those down into subatomic elements and go all the way back. The farther you go back in this way of trying to make sense of the universe, the more everything falls apart into incoherence. So we don't find intelligibility, we find decoherence. Intelligibility requires unification of elements into something more uh, complex. So. If you want to make sense of the world, Teilhard says, after you've gone back to the past and are sitting on the pile of sand to which analysis has reduced the world, uh, turn around 180 degrees and start looking and marching toward the future. 
And then you'll find, as you move toward the cosmic future, that the elements are starting to come together, atoms into molecules, molecules into cells, cells into organisms, organisms into societies, and so on and so forth. So to find intelligibility, you have to wait. You have to <laughs> look toward the future. You have to adopt the position, a disposition of expectation. And only by looking toward the future then can we begin to see what's really going on inside this awakening universe. So we need, in order to do that, we need a whole new worldview or a whole new way of reading the universe. And I'll close uh, with this. We need an anticipatory vision. And here I'm uh, influenced especially by Teilhard, but also by many, many others as well. If we look at the universe as a drama of awakening, maybe it can make more sense to us. And that means that we don't have to do away with the classic hierarchy or, the, or with the intuitions that are buried in that hierarchical universe. But in, instead of seeing the hierarchy as vertical and static, and instead of thinking of God as up above, think of the hierarchy as a gradually emerging one, so that the story of the universe is one in which f first matter comes about, and even that is quite a process. But eventually matter awakens into life, and life into sentience, and sentience into mind. And then mind is capable of faith. This is a new way of locating faith, the place of faith in this new cosmic story. What is faith, cosmologically speaking? We have a lot of analysis of faith, psychologically speaking, and, and even in terms of evolutionary biology, but cosmologically, faith is the way in which the universe, now that it has awakened to mind, seeks to awaken further to something that seems to be calling it, to newness of being and newness of meaning, to what uh, we might call indestructible rightness, the sense that all religions have had, that there's something indestructibly right that's attracting us and that's, uh, that we need to attend to if we're to live moral and happy lives. Or in the Abrahamic context, what we might refer to in the words of the Protestant theologian Wolfhart Pannenberg, the power of the future all of which are words for what we call God. So as Teilhard puts it in this anticipatory vision, the world rests on the future, not the past. The past is rather sandy soil on which to erect a firm sense of the cosmos. If you want a sense of the, what Teilhard calls the consistence, the solidity, uh, the groundedness of things, Look not toward the past, nor toward the up above, but toward the future that's calling the world. And I think that this is a, kind of a framework that can contextualize what Pope Francis is trying to say in Laudato Si as well. So that transcendence doesn't mean just that which is up above, but if the world is inherently temporal, that which intends, that which transcends a temporal world, has to be, in some sense, futurity. So futurity, as the Marxist philosopher Ernst Bloch would say, futurity is the very essence of God. And so can we not say, and this is perhaps a little bit more than what I want to say uh, and would require a lot of unfolding, but if the world is temporal and not just spatial, then in some sense, can we not think of God as somehow, as Pannenberg says it, says it, in some sense, not yet. And that spirituality would take the form primarily of a wayfaring hope and patience, a bridled expectation. And is not, I mean, a lot of people will say, well, doesn't hope rob us of the happiness of the present? No. Hope is the happiness of the present. And virtue, our moral lives, would take shape 
in a new way if we saw them as empowered by a sense that the universe is still coming into being and that uh, our human dignity, our creativity consists partly of our sense of contributing, of making a contribution to the ongoing creation of the universe. This is what I mean by faith. Uh, in this sense, faith is essential to the ongoing awakening of the universe. And I'll end with just a few lines from Teilhard. What is most vitally necessary to the thinking earth, which is by which he means the universe, nature in general, is a faith and a great faith and ever more faith. So faith doesn't take us away from the universe. Faith is the way in which the universe continues its journey toward what uh, Pope Francis calls infinite beauty. To know that we are not prisoners, to know that there is a way out, that there is air and light and love somewhere beyond the reach of all death. To know this, to know that it is neither an illusion nor a fairy tale. This is the darkling thrush speaking here. That if we are not to perish, smothered in the very stuff of our being, is what we must at all costs secure. And this, he says, is the evolutionary role of faith and religion. Thank you very much.